is John Authors, Senior Editor at Bloomberg in New York, where he covers markets and writes the daily newsletter, Points of Return. Prior to his current role, John was with the Financial Times for 29 years. He has written five books, including The Fearful Rise of the Markets and its sequel, Europe's Financial Crisis, which were both published by the FT Press in 2010 and 2012. John, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. Let me start by asking you a few questions to set the ground, if I may. Firstly, the definition of ESG has varied over time from ethical investing to socially responsible investing to ESG and sustainability. How do you define ESG? And what's the issue with so many names? Secondly, we have observed companies that have done well through the pandemic also are the ones that do well in ESG. So I would also love to get your views on this. And last but not least, could you please share your views on the difference in perception of ESG in the United States and the rest of the world? And without further ado, John, I leave the floor to you. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. That is a, a very good way to start into what I was hoping to talk about. It's always a great privilege uh, and a pleasure to uh, talk to audiences, particularly in Turkey. I'm obviously very sad indeed, given the circumstances we all know about, that this doesn't give me an excuse for a trip to Istanbul. As I speak, it's raining here in New York. I would far rather be with you in Turkey. So uh, this is a the, the whole question of defining ESG, what you're trying to do with ESG that is something that has changed and developed over the 30 years I've been covering investments and it's moved in a very different direction, but it's still, I think, perhaps the most important issue that people who are trying to work in ESG need to consider, that people are still not clear exactly what the definition is. Now, when I started, the idea was ethical investing, and at that point, it was very much like the doctor's oath to do no harm. The idea was that you could exclude certain sectors that you found uh, a problem. Uh, in many ways, this was like avoiding sin. So, for example, you could exclude tobacco, alcohol, arms, stocks, and so on. Now, plainly different people have different views of uh, morality, uh, a, a group of, uh, we, I'm speaking as uh, we have the talk with uh, uh, Amy Coney Barrett going on in Washington, and obviously some people's view of uh, the morality of abortion, for example, is very different from the view of other people about that topic. So it started very much just as a way to exclude certain companies. There was no particular attempt to persuade particular companies to behave better. Then you see a move into what was known as SRI in English, socially responsible investing. And that was the beginning of an attempt actively to encourage certain companies to behave better. The idea of socially responsible investing was more to try to pick companies that are actually behaving well by some particular metric and encourage them. The idea was also at this point to uh, be, be an active investor in uh, using the power you had as a shareholder to encourage better behavior. So under SRI, the idea is that you uh, actively encourage companies to behave well. Again, not necessarily clear how you do that. And now for the last five or 10 years, that has changed again to the idea of ESG for environmental, social and governance. And the notion now is that we do have clear ideas of what we're trying to encourage and that those ideas, uh, the company's environmental performance, its social performance and its governance performance will not only improve society or, or whatever you're trying to achieve, they're not just moral um, 
they're not just moral aims, they're also aims that will improve society, that, that sorry, that will improve the company's performance in the same way that, for example, value might improve it or momentum. If you look for ESG factors, those are factors that should ultimately help you find strong performance. Now, what is interesting is whether that whether we can accept that ESG factors really do lead to better performance. There is a lot of evidence in the literature that they can do. Uh, you should particularly look to the work of a Harvard Business School professor called George Serafayim, who's been very influential in finding that uh, looking for the best performing stocks on ESG criteria will also get you uh, the stocks that perform uh, perform best in terms of their uh, their financial return but there is some fascinating room for difference over this now i'll just try to share screen now so that you can look at um perhaps the the statement that still dominates discussion about this which is by the great conservative um economist Milton Friedman back in 1970, who very strongly attacked the idea that social responsibility was anything that a company should ever take into account or that investors should take into account. His idea was that, uh, was that companies should simply do their best to make money. Uh, obviously, if they're doing stuff that's illegal or that's really damaging society around it, that will end up costing them in terms of profits. So they shouldn't do it. You should rely on capitalism to make sure that they behave reasonably well. And then those investing in them should uh, take the money and invest it, uh, invest it wisely or give it to charity. But this was the clear approach which has dominated thinking in America, but not anything like the same extent in Europe for the last 50 years. Now, last year in the States, you had a new approach uh, from the Business Roundtable, which is uh, arguably the most influential group of uh, business interest in the US, where I am, saying that while they did have a purpose, uh, a commitment to, to working for their shareholders, there was this broader concept of working for stakeholders. You need to deliver value to your customers and to your employees. You have to behave ethically with suppliers. Uh, you have to look at the long-term uh, benefits for the community and for society. So this was a huge change in philosophy which suggested that the US is now coming to meet the rest of the world on this issue that recognizing that companies shouldn't narrowly look to improve shareholder value there's obviously many complaints that the reason we have the extent the se severeness of uh, inequality uh, in the western world now is because companies focused too narrowly on their shareholders and profits. But that debate isn't over, at least not in this country. What I'm showing you now is uh, from uh, a piece for the Wall Street Journal written by Eugene Scalia, who is the son of the uh, late but very famous conservative Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, who now runs the Department of Labor under President Trump who is proposing that uh, pension funds covered by the Department of Labor, which is some trillions of dollars, should not be allowed to take ESG factors into account. Uh, they're simply not, they're not, in his view, allowed to do that. They must only maximize uh, returns for their, uh, for their shareholders. Now, I personally think that he's wrong about this. 
two levels. One is that uh, companies are perfectly entitled to, or investors are perfectly entitled to aim to maximize uh, other things than um, other things than uh, financial return if that's what their employees, what their clients want. Going back to where investing was 20 or 30 years ago, if you're uh, working for a religious institution, plainly you're entitled to make alterations to be in line with the religious beliefs of your clients. Uh, and if you view yourself uh, as looking after the long-term interests of your clients, then plainly it's part of their interest that they have uh, a world that, uh, that has a livable, breathable climate when they retire. Secondly, there is plenty of evidence that ESG factors do indeed help uh, your ultimate investment return improve. So I, I personally think that, uh, uh, that Scalia is wrong about this, but this continues to be an intense intellectual debate in the US, even though it's widely accepted uh, in the rest of the world. Uh, we still need, I think, to resolve that issue at a, at a level uh, the US continues in, in anything to do with investment continues to be hugely influential. Uh, and that issue needs to be resolved. It's a debate that still needs to be had. Now, if we look uh, at the level of performance of shares, I'll try to show you some slides again now. What is plain is that ESG investing really has delivered. What you should be seeing here is how um, MSCI, the main indexing group that's used for international investing. If you look at the US, you'll see that uh, ESG investing over the last 12 months uh, has gained a quite remarkable 32%. Now, that's more than the overall benchmark, which is very similar to the S&P, the MSCI US, which is up just over 19%. So it's obvious that in the last 12 months, uh, being involved in ESG factors has been very good for investors. However, you also have to note that if you were looking for growth stocks, which particularly includes the main technology companies, they would have done even better. And meanwhile, value companies, have, which have been doing terribly, those are companies that you buy because they look cheap compared to their fundamentals, have actually declined over the last year. So this plainly gives you the sense that ESG investing at this point, the factors that you look for when you, uh, when you look for an ESG company align very much with the, comp the factors you look for when you are, um, sorry, I'm just giving you a bigger, bigger screen here. They align very much with the uh, factors you look for when you're looking for growth. So this implies that once the worst of the economo economic crisis is over, once we return to something more like uh, normal growth, ESG factor may not perform as well. Now, if we take a look at the same exercise for the emerging markets, you get the same result. Uh, obviously, the emerging markets haven't performed as well as the US, but over the last year, uh, MSCI's index of ESG leaders has gained 18%, while its main benchmark for emerging markets is up only about 10%. And again, it's lagging behind growth stocks, but a very long way ahead of value stocks. So ESG has proved itself very nicely in this last crisis. Uh, it would have limited the worst of your losses on the way down, and it has outperformed the rest of the market on the way up again. So plainly, there is something very attractive about 
ESG investing at present. This was a major test of the ESG concept that we've just su suffered through, and it seems to have worked. But there is an issue. This is a very interesting study by uh, Vincent Deloard, who is uh, the chief quantitative uh, strategist at StoneX over in San Francisco. And what he's looking at here is how the big companies that are part of uh, ESG exchange traded funds tends to be different from other companies. Uh, and you see a lot of factors which are very attractive that they tend to have stronger margins, that they tend to have higher profitability through return of equity, uh, return on equity, and that they tend to have a slightly higher book value even when you include intangibles. What is worrying is that they tend to have a much smaller workforce. So the companies that we are investing in when we uh, use ESG criteria certainly are good, strong, profitable companies. But there is, I think, reason to fear that focusing on ESG criteria as we currently define them could lead you into investing in companies that have particularly small labor forces and therefore there is this risk uh, that you will end up with um, with companies that uh, are less um, less likely to help the economy grow, less likely to improve employment and so on. This isn't an insuperable issue, but it's certainly something that people pursuing this concept must look at. A lot of the high tech companies with low, with, with small workforces do indeed look quite good on a lot of ESG criteria. They, they are socially responsible. They have, you know, they have generally strong governance. Obviously, they're not creating a lot of pollution, but they're also not employing that many people. Uh, so this again suggests that perhaps uh, to uh, to to use this concept to move forward with uh, ESG so that it really does improve society that it gives us the kind of long term economic strength that we want isn't so much to um, invest in the best behaving companies but to be active investors and invest in companies that aren't necessarily behaving so well and use the power that shareholders have over a company to force them into better behavior. Uh, I still strongly think that that is the single best way that uh, ESG investors can perform their, their best function is by being active and aggressive investors. Um, and there are more reasons for that. Obviously, there is a, a great popularity of passive investing these days, of just, just matching an index. Uh, and there are many good reasons for doing that. It reduces costs for investors. It reduces risk. There are good reasons why a lot of money should be managed that way. But it has the disadvantage that passive investors will never sell their stock uh, and company managements know that uh, and passive investors are trying to minimize their costs which means they prefer not to undergo the, the uh, costs that are involved in uh, in fighting with managements so for those who are active managers i think it's a very important part of what active managers should be doing and of their mission should at this should at this point now very clearly be to uh, to become much more aggressive with companies and unapologetically follow ESG criteria when they're doing so. Uh, 
companies, in other words, should be forced by uh, shareholders. This is a way of dealing with the conundrum of Milton Friedman, make it in companies' interests to behave better or otherwise their share price will go down, is a much more potent way of doing ESG investing. Now, um, Asli, you asked me to start at the, the start of to uh, to talk about the problems that we still have with with definitions, uh, and they are very significant. Now, I'd like again to show you some 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 uh, some slides that demonstrate this. Let me show you that again. Now, this is from a study by three academics um, who were all originally at the London Business School, Elroy Dimson, Paul Marsh, uh, and Mike Staunton. And they are very major um, financial historians. They've pieced back data on how, um, how uh, the stock markets have performed back to the beginning of the last century. Uh, and this is from their most recent survey, which looked at the um, different ratings that different companies have produced on ESG. Uh, and what they are looking here is the degree of correlation, the degree of agreement between FTSE, MSCI and uh, and. Um, Oh, sorry, but between the FTSE and Sustainalytics, between MSCI and Sustainalytics, and between MSCI and FTSE. So you can see that overall, even when it comes to ESG, companies that meet all three criteria, there is really quite weak correlation between those three rating agencies. Indeed, there's only a, a, a 0.3 correlation between MSCI and FTSE uh, over what ESG rankings overall should be. Now, on environmental, you can see that those correlations uh, are lower, uh, and they're also quite weak when it comes to social. But the remarkable one is when we look at governance, uh, and frankly, these are you know, these are the three most respected um, overall institutions for looking at ESG. There is no agreement at all, frankly, on which companies are have good governance and which companies have bad governance. That one company is well rated by one of those agencies has no impact at all on whether they're likely to be well rated by another one. There is just no agreement on this. Now, that is a serious issue. It's still not clear what uh, ESG investors require of companies in terms of good governance and so obviously we're not likely to get uh, any good clear response from companies in res in response to that pressure and it's not clear what investors are looking for now if we okay if we take a look at this graphic also from dimson marsh and staunton they have looked at how the ratings for these six companies varied across FTSE, Sustainalytics, and MSCI. This is Facebook, JP Morgan, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Walmart, and Wells Fargo. And this includes in Facebook, uh, and uh, obviously a very, very controversial company, and Wells Fargo, which is still recovering from a major scandal. Uh, Walmart is obviously, a, again, another very important company, which is very unpopular among many people, plainly it gets lots of complaints about the social impact its stores have had but if you look you can see that the ratings these companies have are totally varied so for for example facebook is viewed as having a terrible environmental record a zero rating or a 100 rating depending on which rating agency you look at JP Morgan's governance is viewed as having a zero or a 100 
rating, depending on who you look at. Wells Fargo's governance similarly varies from zero to 100 and so on. There is really no particular agreement, even on these huge, well-known and very important companies as to where, as to what is good and what is bad in terms of ESG, uh, ESG characteristics. Now, that's most true of governance, but it's a problem beyond that. Now, if we take a look, this is a further study that was produced by uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, and this looks at a range of companies. Uh, and we've got six rating agencies here, which you can see. Sustainalytics, Robico, Vigeo, KLD, Asset 14, and MSCI. Uh, and again, the extent of the uh, difference over these companies is extraordinary. The top company you see there is Intel, and you can see that depending on who you look at, it's somewhat below average for ESG, or it's virtually perfect for ESG, and so on down the list. Uh, and if we take a look, this next slide is a thing of beauty, uh, but this gives you a list. On the left, we see the top 100 stocks which have the greatest agreement among ESG providers. And again, you can see there's quite a spread uh, from between the best and the worst right the way through those 100 companies. And on the right, you have the 100 stocks of the greatest disagreement. Uh, and again, it looks like a piece of modern art. Uh, there's really nothing obvious that you can see in terms of a pattern, no particular reason uh, with any of those companies that a good rating from one company would mean uh, a good rating. Now, this plainly is a very important issue because we simply don't know what we're looking for. Uh, and uh, while there is that degree of confusion over definitions, uh, it's much harder for ESG to have a positive effect. This is particularly true, again, I think, on the critical issue of governance, which is also the issue which I think ESG investing can have the greatest influence over. So I think, for me, the, the greatest problem with ESG at present, the greatest question that ESG investing has to answer is, what is good governance? What do we want of companies? And having decided what good governance is, are we prepared to be active investors and try to improve performance? I think that's the most important challenge facing ESG, and that's true uh, in the US, it's true in the emerging markets, and a clear answer to that will help deal with the ongoing debate in the US over whether ESG is even a legitimate way to allocate money and a legitimate way for, for companies to run themselves. Now, um, now, I think those are the most important questions for the rest of this conference. I'm afraid I think I've spoken a little too long to take any questions now, but I do hope that, these, that this will uh, give you some kind of an agenda for the rest of the conference. With that, thank you very much indeed, and I'd like to return to uh, Asli. Thank you, John. That was great. Definitely a lot of food for thought. I've taken a lot of messages myself. Active versus passive, uh, shareholder, primacy versus stakeholder, capitalism. Uh, we have almost enough material for another summit, uh, and it looks like you know making it uh, work depends a lot on making it in the company's interest to do well. So hope to speak to you later, later. and you have a good time. Thank you. Bye-bye.